Hello, I'm Deb Cheslow, and in this four-part series, I'll be sharing information related to the awareness and prevention of domestic violence and violence against women. Did you know that one in seven women and one in 18 men have been stalked to the point of being scared for their safety? Join me in discussing the issue of stalking are Stephen Bradley and Michelle Simonson. Stephen Bradley is the safety and technology specialist for the Florida Coalition Against Domestic Violence. With a law enforcement career focusing on investigating crimes against persons specializing in sex crimes, child abuse, domestic violence, and crimes against the elderly, Steve was recruited by the FBI to start a task force that would investigate technology and cyber-related crimes. Michelle Simonson has served as an assistant state attorney since 1998. She's responsible for making filing decisions in felony domestic violence criminal cases. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. So Steve, what a career. Law enforcement, the FBI, tell me more about that. Absolutely. It's, it's actually kind of funny. I call myself a, an oxymoron, if you will. Two words don't go together. I'm a law enforcement officer, but I'm also an advocate. So being on both sides of the fence hopefully allows us to bridge the gap between our professional law enforcement partners, our advocates, as well as the prosecution and the judicial side of these type of cases. Interesting. And, and tell me, uh, elaborate a little bit more on, on how the FBI came into the mix. Well, that was an interesting story. Um, what happened was, back in our jurisdiction, those of you that remember dial-up and DSL cable modems, the bridge between that happened around 1998. That's old stuff. Uh, old school, <laughs> right. And when you hooked the phone with dial-up, your termination was disconnected from the Internet. But with DSL and cable modems, you're online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what was happening in our jurisdiction, because... Nationwide, most, most home computers are kept in some form of a bedroom. What was happening in our jurisdiction was people were hacking into their computers and turning on the webcams. And they were taking pictures of people in different stages of dress, making love to their partner, or a multitude of things, and then emailing them back to them for a ransom. If you don't pay us five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, we're going to share these images with your neighbors, coworkers, family, and friends. Goodness. So, because we just got email at this point, we didn't really know how to investigate these type of cases. So we reached out to the FBI, and the rest is kind of history. Uh, they were actually starting to look at investigating crimes like this themselves, and it just took off from there. Amazing. It's, a, it, it's interesting how things just fall into place unexpectedly, absolutely, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and how about you, Michelle, an assistant state attorney? How, tell me a, a little bit about how you got to where you are now. Certainly. Like Stephen, um, I have a little bit of experience on both sides of the fence. I started out as a prosecutor in South Carolina back in 1991, and then I switched the sides and became an assistant federal public defender for about five years before I transferred down here. Um, I got a job as an assistant state attorney, and I started out in the sex crimes, was pregnant, had a child, took a little bit of time off. And when I came back, I came back into the world of domestic violence. I was looking at misdemeanor cases at that time, and I did that up until about eight months ago, um, when I began exclusively handling the felony domestic violence intake in our office. Great. So let's dive right in. Okay. What is stalking? Stalking is, it's been defined, defined differently in different, different jurisdictions, but mainly it's the malicious, willful, repeated following of somebody, whether it be cyber stalking or just repeated behavior without any type of um, cause of malicious intent or harm with somebody. Cyber stalking. I, I think we should go a little bit deeper on that because I think when most people hear the word stalking, especially with today's lingo, absolutely. they tend to think about somebody hiding around the corner staring at them from beyond. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. With technology the way it is today, with our social media presence, social media is the number one activity online today. So with the social media, online dating, all types of tools that we use every day, stalking has become more of an online technology type of presence or tool rather than the traditional following you, you know, behind the corner, as you stated. Um, so it's definitely opened a lot of avenues for offenders to be able to stalk from the comfort of the living room. Now, do you find that it, the, the cyber aspect has taken over drastically, or, or do you still deal with physical stalking at all? There is still some physical stalking. Of course, it's going to happen. But with technology today, with software that's available free on the Internet, apps that are out there, again, social media, 
A lot of times you see on TV people hack computers. It must be got to understand, people don't hack computers necessarily, we hack people. So we prey on people's you know, vulnerabilities or you know, the weakest links. So some people won't set their phones up properly or safety settings on their devices to keep them safe. So it allows these perpetrators or offenders opportunities to maybe listen to their phone calls, track their whereabouts through the GPS settings on their phone, Bluetooth, location services, a lot of things that we, we'd have to talk about and discuss on how to keep people safe from that type of activity. So how would you keep people safe? Uh, just let's start with the basics. What kind of, what would you do on your phone to prevent well, someone? Well, on the phone, of course you want to put a password on your phone, but that way it prevents somebody from having physical access to your phone. So if you happen to leave your phone in the back of an Uber or, or you know, in a you know, office somewhere, I can't take your phone and just start going through your phone or install malicious software like spyware to your phone in order to track or to stalk you. So passwords are really good for your phone. But also, more importantly, because of social media and our social media presence, having your privacy settings turned on is very important. I always encourage people to go through your privacy settings and see what people can see about you. A lot of times we put all our stuff out there. Hey, I'm going on a seven-day cruise. And then you come home and everything's, your house has been broken into and your TV's now missing because you told everybody where you were because your privacy settings were not turned on. Have it so only your friends and family can see what you're doing if you want to put stuff like that. Or do it when you get back. You know, tell people about your vacation when you get back from your vacation. That way you're safer. So it's how we actually operate social media and how we operate online is the most important thing. Bluetooth settings. A lot of times phones are turned on. Bluetooth's turned on by default. Well, Bluetooth operates on a 2.4 gigahertz frequency, which means it travels over the airwaves. There are devices available today that allows me to scan your Bluetooth device and pick up possible your GPS location based off the communication between maybe a smartwatch or a Fitbit with your actual phone because a lot of them are GPS enabled. So there's all types of devices we use in our everyday lives that we don't realize how vulnerable we can be. So just on a, a slight side note here, sure. I'm, I'm seeing um, a couple of issues arise here in, in the audience that on one end we've got the older generations that barely know how to turn the phone on and now you're talking about privacy settings and this setting and Bluetooth and, and then on the other side of the spectrum we have the young kids who every app no, needs everything. all of those things in their opinion. So Absolutely. what would you say to both those extremes? Well there is an extreme because it is today, it's very common today that our senior citizens, our grandparents, they're on social media. Some are even online dating. So to have those conversations and to and to be aware of how online actually works. Maybe even take some classes or talk to the younger generations. Our, our grandkids, our kids, they'll help us through this, especially if you want to stay safe through these type of situations and stay private, stay protected. Um, also, Google is your friend. You can always Google, you know, privacy <laughs> settings for my phone, privacy settings for my Facebook, my Instagram, my Twitter, whatever social media platform you use, you can Google it. Google is your friend. It's then they will tell you how, how to set these devices up if you're not aware on how to do True. it. So you mentioned talk to your grandkids. Do the, does stalking span all ages or is all it typically ages. the teenage realm? Well, the, the, the highest population of people stalk, they say, is 18 to 24 statistically. But we know it happens with all age groups and all populations, all races, all religions, all cultures. Stalking happens in a wide spectrum. It's not a type of crime that is specific to one class. So although our youth are 18 to 24 statistically is more likely to be stalked, it can happen with anybody. So what, what do you think, what are some warning signs, some things to look out for? Uh, again, we use that term stalking very generically in our lingo nowadays. Absolutely. So I don't even think most people realize that they're being stalked. And you're absolutely correct. In pop, pop culture today, stalking is used in dating. Girl, you stalking me? You stalking my social media? You stalking my Facebook? So it is. It's a very loose term. So again, you're right. You don't may not know you're being stalked, but if there's any cases where you have constant unwanted behaviors, where people are showing up at your work, showing up at your your house, showing up at class, or if they're sending you gifts that are unwanted, um, making threats even, making threats about your 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 pet or a family member or a friend. If you don't come talk to me, I'm going to kick your dog. You know, just for example. So there's all types of behaviors that if it seems like it's out of place, it's unwanted, it's repeated multiple times. And what the statute says, if it causes substantial emotional distress. So if it's causing you harm or stress, it doesn't have to be threatening in nature. I don't have to threaten to harm you. 
If I do, that's an increased penalty. We can go for a felony with that. But just, an, you know, and some causes emotional distress to somebody repeated on multiple levels can be viewed as stalking. And I would encourage victims, um, which we do, to keep a log of these types of conduct, whether it's a notebook or something. But if, if there is this unwanted conduct that's occurring, whatever form or fashion it's coming in, note it, what was the date, was anybody else around? If there's a screenshot that you need to take of a message or something like that, send it to somebody else or whatever so that if someone gets hold of your phone, it's preserved for later. Uh, a lot of with the social media, you know, sometimes things disappear. But if you're keeping that log, it, it, it helps um, us down the road if a criminal prosecution comes about. Very good point. That's and, a great point. And also, to reiterate on that, also when you do these stalking logs, if it is coming through technology, a cyber stalking type case, please try to write down and capture how it came in. Was it on Facebook? Was mm -hmm. it on Twitter? Was it a text message? That way, when law enforcement gets these cases, they know where to start, where to issue search warrants or subpoenas to in order to obtain the necessary information to work that case properly. Mm -hmm. So our screenshots, videos, recorded, because we can record just about anything nowadays mm -hmm. on a phone, on a computer. Are those types of things now being used, be admissible? Or? Absolutely. Okay. And, and tech, the case law is being developed as technology is coming about. With the more social media forms that we have, the case law is being developed about the admissibility of various forms of evidence. Um, one of the things that we ran into a number of years ago was being able to show that a message was sent from one phone to another, but how do we tie that phone to that individual and show that that individual is the person who sent the message or sent the text or sent the post. So there, there's a lot of um, each piece of information that we're collecting is very important so that we can determine where the source is and tie it back to the individual that we're seeking charges against. Makes sense. Now, now what about on the side of the victim or the pr proposed victim mm -hmm. if, if someone feels that way. Is it important from the law side that at some point they've said stop or if you do this again I'm going to report you or, or how, what do we need to do about that? Absolutely. And, and what the statute says has to be a course of contact. It has to be a pattern of events. And usually it's two or more events. But yes, I encourage victims or survivors to say, you know, please stop. You know, whether it be a text or a message, please stop contacting me. That way it helps us build a stronger case mm -hmm. that this was you know, unwanted behavior. You know, she asked him to stop or he asked him to stop and they continue to contact or continue to harass them. So it just builds a tighter, tighter case for the mm -hmm. state attorney's <laughs> office to move forward on these. Makes sense. Now, we were talking earlier and you said something very interesting that in 2012 there was a big shift and that word intention can you Absolutely. elaborate? Absolutely. And, and Michelle can talk more about the actual criminal piece of that. But the list law changed in the state of Florida in 2012, October 1st, 2012. And there's a couple of things that actually changed in that. The first was the course of conduct or pattern of events. Prior to 2012, we had to have three or more events to move forward on a stalking case. Now, it's two or more. So two or more, it doesn't have to be the same thing. It can be a text message, a tweet, an Instagram post. Two or more behaviors, that's now a course of conduct. The other thing that changed was credible threat. A credible threat, when we add the component of credible threat to the unwanted um, malicious behavior, uh, unwanted contact from somebody, that now changes it to aggravated stalking, which is a felony in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. So if, I, if we can prove that person had the apparent means and ability to commit, not commit threat or to fulfill the threat, we can charge them with a felony with that piece. But this law is inherently different than every other law that we have in the statute book whereas every other statute requires the element of intent. We have to prove the person intended to make the or intended to make good on the threat, not with cyber stalking or stalking. In 2012, it actually removed the element of needed intent. So no longer do we have to prove the person intended to, to actually make good on these threats. So if, if I'm intoxicated and I fire off a text because I'm so, mad, it doesn't matter that I... Once you send it, you own it. That's correct. <laughs> Once you send it, you own it. I don't have to prove that it was a, a drunk text or a drunk tweet or a butt dial. We hear that a lot as well. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to do it or somebody else did it. No. If it came from your device and said, we don't have to prove that you intended to do, cause harm. And what have you seen uh, on your side with this change? And, and 
the physical stalking cases versus the cyber stalking and intent versus no intent? How, how, is, how are things changing from your perspective? I think a lot of times what we come across is a combination of um, activity. We have physical stalking, driving by a residence, showing up at a residence, but we also have the cyber stalking as well. There's usually in combination. They're finding out where the person is, showing up where they are, um, sending social media posts and things like that. So we tend to have a combination of those. With stalking cases, we have a variety of ways of dealing with them. Um, we can file a misdemeanor stalking charge, which might be a, a little bit more on a minor scale. Um, it only carries up to a penalty of one year in jail. But we also have these options with the aggravated stalking, which is a felony. Um, so one is available with the credible threat in addition to the course of conduct. But we also have an aggravated stalking, which is when someone engages in stalking behavior after, a viol after an injunction has been filed. Um, individuals now can also apply for a stalking injunction. So even if a criminal case is not filed. If, if you would, make, make that clear to the viewers. It's, we're, we're covering all age ranges here. That, that word injunction is a big one yes. for somebody. What exactly do you mean by that? Injunction is a fancy word for a protective order or a restraining order. There are a number of different types of injunctions that victims can seek from family court, one of which is a stalking injunction. They would have to show that there were prior um, instances of conduct in which they've been stalked and that they have a fear for their safety. And a family court judge is one of the judges who reviews their petition for the injunction and holds a hearing and decides whether or not there's sufficient evidence that a stalking injunction should be issued for their safety. Okay. And then from there? You, you from there, we have another number of other types of injunctions that are valid, but whether or not a criminal prosecution is initiated, and a victim can certainly seek the protection of a restraining order to keep their safety. And that's the primary concern that we have for all victims, domestic violence, stalking violence, dating violence. What can we do to keep a person safe? So can you give some real world, world examples of things you've run into? Because I, I think a lot of people are listening to this right now and they're going to the extreme of, of what they see on television and going, well, that's not me. But you were sharing some real world examples with me earlier. That I, I, absolutely. There, there's all types of examples of how this, what stalking can look like. And when I say repeated behavior causing substantial emotional stress, what's that mean? Someone's contacting me through iMessage or through Facebook Messenger or Snapchat and they're, you know, constantly, you know, blowing your phone up or they're saying, you know, you know, I like you, you know, whatever. Why aren't you not, why aren't you talking to me? Stuff like that. So, but we're seeing these cases as they're being reported. Again, they might not recognize as stalking, but it's not only them as well. It's when it's reported, sometimes, because the injunctions are, are fairly easy to get, these charges, these, these cases are being charged as violation of injunction charges rather than stalking charges or aggravated stalking charges. Um, if you're under the age of 16 in the state of Florida, it's mm -hmm. automatically a felony. It's automatically aggravated stalking. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all kinds of things that we can do with these, with these injunctions and with um, technology as it comes in and these cases come in to, to prevent that. Uh, one, one case what we talked about earlier was a gentleman that was videotaping himself. He was videotaping himself following this young lady everywhere she went and then posting them on YouTube and posting them on Vimeo and all kinds of different video platforms social media platforms, um, and then, then he would basically cause harm to her that way. Even though she got an injunction for protection, he was, it was clearly stalking, he was clearly stalking her. He videotaped himself one time where he set the camera down and ran after her car and actually touched her car in one of the cases. Um, but it wasn't looked at as stalking, even though it's clearly you know, a pattern of stalking behavior. It's unwanted contact, it's malicious, repeated behavior. So those kind of cases we look at and we actually, we ask ourselves why weren't they, you know, looked at as stalking. And we find because it's difficult and because of pop culture and because of stalking and how it's used today, people may not recognize and realize it's actually stalking. So they'll go for like a violation of injunction or different charges uh, to hold these offenders accountable. And we talked about that earlier as well. He was indicating there was a case somewhere where they had a number of counts of violation of injunction. I know here we look at those to see whether we can possibly aggregate them and file a charge of aggravated stalking, which would be the felony. And maybe you're charging an honor between the first date that some conduct occurred and a later date that some conduct occurred. And that allows you to show that repeated course of conduct and helps establish your case more strongly. Correct, correct. The other most common way today to stalk somebody, believe it or not, is with your cell phone. Because mm -hmm. uh, so we, we carry our cell phones everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. We're very dependent. 
our kids carry cell phones, our parents carry cell phones, our grandparents carry cell phones. So they're, they're a tool that has, we have easy access to. But there are programs and devices out there that allow me to read all your text messages, listen to your phone calls, turn on the speaker or your phone and listen to your conversation you're having in the room with somebody else. So you're, you're saying my phone is not private? Not, you could get into my phone right now and see my I can get your phone. I can get in your phone very easily right now in a multitude of ways uh, with software that's readily available on the internet. Uh, and it's, it's, sold in it's sold as parental monitoring tools, but what's created for good oftentimes used for evil. So these, these stalkers or these offenders or taking these type of technologies and use them against their victims. Even drones, we see drones today. Drones are very common. We see drones being sold in Targets and Walmarts and any type of you know, hobby shop today. But stalking drones, they actually sell stalking drones or follow me drones to videotape yourself. So someone thought, well, if I can videotape myself, how easy would it be, would be to put a GPS tracker in my victim's car, mm -hmm. launch my drone, and it'll follow her, videotape her, report back her location, anything she's doing, and then when the battery dies, it comes home to me. So all types of technologies we mm -hmm. see that we use every day are being used for stalking type behavior. And, and I think another issue probably is, is a false sense of security because on the perpetrator side, people think that stuff they, they send is going to disappear oh, or be deleted mm -hmm. and it's really Still hanging there. out in the background? There, there are several apps out there. and We'll, we'll talk about Snapchat. Snapchat is probably the most, most commonly known. Snapchat has this whole false sense of security that everything deletes in 10 seconds. Uh, so I may be able to stalk you or, or send a picture of a gun, me holding the gun and say, I'm going to get you. And it's going to delete in 10 seconds. Lies programs are not delete programs. They're not self-destruct programs. They're what's called auto-hide programs. So that information still, still may be available for law enforcement to want to extract out of that phone or out of that device for us to move forward in those cases. So there is a false sense of security about different types of apps and how they work. That's why you know, a lot of our youth use them today for a lot of adult behaviors because they think, again, it deletes, nobody's going to see it. If I do a screenshot of that message, I'm going to get a message back saying they screenshot of that message. And that's not so necessarily true because there's a lot more apps out there that will unhide those pictures automatically or unhide those snaps automatically and save them to their phone and then spread them out to the whole school or to the whole community after the fact. So basically, we don't want to be putting anything out there without intent. Absolutely correct. Because everything is there forever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely correct. There are, there are several websites on the internet. Um, Archive.com is just one of them that basically takes a screenshot of the internet. Once it's online, it's online forever. Exactly. You may be able to take it down, do a takedown notice and have something taken down, but in the meantime, I save that on a thumb drive. So as soon as you take it down, I plug it back in the computer and it's back up there again for the whole world to see. So there's a lot of things. That's why I we'll say repeated behavior from stalkers, that's repeated behavior. If I put a you know, Facebook post up there and you take it down, I put it right back up there again. If I put pictures of you out there without your permission, there's things that we can do. So with all of that in mind, I think we've uh, opened some eyes tonight. I know I'm going to certainly be doing some things differently. Absolutely. I'm now out there and I'm saying, oh my goodness, that's me. What would the next step be? How, how can I protect myself uh, if, if I really do fear for my life or the life of my family members? What's the, what's the next action step? Biggest things I would say is privacy settings. Even, even in your pictures and your location settings, when you download an app, there's a lot of verbiage that pops up that people don't read and they hit accept because they want that app. But that verbiage will say, even though you're turning off your location services in your phone, I'm still going to give away your location because I'm your dating app or your Groupon app. Your pictures. A lot of times you take a digital picture, stored with inside your picture is the GPS locations where you're standing when you took that picture. So if you have a work at home business and you're taking pictures of products or if you're just taking selfies, you're putting out your location so somebody can stalk you and can find you that way. So go through your social media, go through your privacy settings. If you're not using Bluetooth, turn it off. So basically look at your device and see how safe and helpful you can be. And then from the prosecution standpoint, of course, I'm looking at building the case. And so I want to have that log that you've written down where each of these social media posts has been made so we know where to start collecting evidence from. I would also encourage um, looking at whether or not you need to file an injunction for protection. Um, and uh, we can help. There's plenty of offices that can help with that. We have victim advocates. There's a family court services office. But we can help prepare the paperwork for that. And additionally, going to law enforcement and taking all of the evidence that you have to law enforcement and initiating a case. 
Okay, so <laughs> basically what I'm hearing is prevention, 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 mm -hmm. and awareness. Become friends with privacy settings. Mm -hmm. Use Google to your advantage. But if that is not working, then there are steps to be taken and don't be afraid to reach out. Absolutely. Correct? Absolutely. Right. Well, thank you both for being thank here you. and sharing such yeah. valuable information. If you or someone you know is involved in an abusive relationship or feels that they are being stalked, there is help. So stay tuned for more information on where to go for assistance. And again, many thanks to the Department of Justice and Office on Violence Against Women for making this programming possible.